Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man that says that if your parents were rich and they didn't buy you a horse, then they didn't love you. It's Dale. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> I ain't never getting no horse. You didn't get a horse? <laughs> no. <laughs> what the hell? I gotta yeah. make some phone calls. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to have a little intervention or something. Yeah. How many horses did you have? I didn't have any. My parents weren't rich. Oh. Yeah. Maybe that's why I ain't getting no damn yeah, horse. I didn't get no horse. <laughs> yeah, I just had to look at everybody else's horses. <laughs> What's uh, going on, bud? Oh, go oh, nothing much. Got any good shout outs for us today? Yeah, I'm going to shout in front of the rooftops. Oh, from the top of the highest mountain. Yeah, yeah. You know what I do? we got a few for us. I would like to give a big thank you to uh, Kathy Brown for the fantastic Facebook recommendations. She thank you, Kathy Brown. Up there in Canada. Canada? Canada. Canada? Yeah. Okay. Shout out to Joe Holler. You get that. That's my boy from Canada. All right. He's a Nova Scotia guy, though. All right. And I like Kathy. And uh, a couple more. We're like, we always give them seems like we uh lean it toward instagram more there's a couple of facebook friends i want to give a shout out to and that's mr bill smith he's always popping in liking comments and pictures and stuff and so is our friend liz snyder all right we, we appreciate you popping in on our socials and giving us some likes and some little thumbs ups and some happiness yep it's all good man and uh man just want to say thanks to all you guys for really kicking butt over the last last month Man, that's just blows my mind. Well, put us over the top for downloads. Yeah. Best month ever. For a short month, it was the best month ever. Yep. And it just it just seems to be growing every month, Dale. Yeah, oh, that's crazy. Isn't it? Yep. Well, we really, really, really appreciate you guys. Yep. And we want to put a little plug here to remind everybody to check out our store page. Yeah. Check out the merch. Check out the T-shirts. We got some cool shirts. We really do. Look around. Yep. I'm telling you. I looked at some other stuff today and i was going man our stuff's really cool yeah we got some good looking shirts <laughs> got some mugs and got some different things go in there check it out get you a crack house shirt mug mug what damn mug yep and <laughs> also go to apple podcast and leave a five star <clears throat> rating and review five star it really does help the cause it does it helps us get found out we want y'all to found us out yeah we want to be found out that's right yep we want to be found <laughs> <laughs> all right bud yeah we want somebody to give some attention besides all you guys you know maybe spotify put us up on a list or something nobody loves us but you guys yep i guess that's really all we need to we have a, we have a pretty hardcore fan base yes we do yeah and it seems to be growing all the time yeah y'all kick butt yep we love y'all very much and good night no I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right we're gonna get in our episode bud all right man so much for the love in there yeah it's fixing okay. to get dark quick yeah it got serious there for a minute all right, me and Dale made eye contact. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got a... Put that part up. Yeah. Put that our, damn partition back up. <laughs> our case this week, man, you know, we've covered serial killers before. and But this one, you know, we always say this one takes the cake or this yeah. one. But this one is by far the worst we've done so far. Yeah. Um, I think so. And just a little reminder, you know, if you get squeamish about talking about serial killers and what they've done and blood and gore and etc yeah yeah then, usually we don't do too much disclaimer stuff because we pretty much know you're here for that but i'm gonna say we're gonna give you one this one <laughs> yeah this one is pretty yeah, rough so yeah. if this stuff bothers you then this may not be for you this made me say damn yeah <laughs> this dude all righty all right but anyway this is the case of richard trenton chase otherwise known as the vampire, vampire of sacramento, sacramento. How about yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Yeah. Now, Richard, he was born on May 23rd, 1950, in Santa Clara, California, to parents Richard Chase Sr., who was a computer specialist. Yeah, on uh, was an Air Force base. Yep. And that was a pretty big deal for a computer specialist in 1950. Mm-hmm. And his mother, Beatrice, and she was a school teacher. Yes. And from all accounts, Richard... From the earliest years, seemed to be a pretty average boy. He's a Cub Scout. Yep. Right and, down your alley. Yeah. And, but, you know, nothing special, nothing, you know, really particular about him. He just seemed just average and normal. Yeah. Boy, that changes. Yep. When he was three years old, the family managed to afford a, a house. 
and they moved to a house in Sacramento. They'd been renting before, not like they'd been living in a tent or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. They were. Yeah. They were renting, but they they had bought a house in Sacramento. Right. Moving on up. Yeah. Well, you'd think a computer specialist in on the Air Force base was making some money, you know? You'd yeah. Think, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, to be able to afford a house, yeah. I mean, hell, most people didn't know what a computer was in 1950. No, huh? They probably took a computer was probably as big as a house. Or bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Shortly after they moved into their house, I think the next year after that, Richard had a sister, Pamela, that was born. Yep. yep. But she was born in 1954. Yep. Now, like I said, Richard was a Cub Scout, and he also played four years of Little League Baseball. Mm-hmm. And seemed like he was well-liked by all of his teachers, and they thought he was a sweet child, and seemed to be pretty popular with his his buddies and his peers, and even with a lot of them coming to his birthday parties. Yeah, and I think he had one party where, like, had 50 people show yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, hell, <laughs> he's popular. Yeah, he was a very popular kid, well-liked. And on the surface, you know, the Chase family was just like any other family you know building a life for themselves you know just not just a normal family <laughs> yeah this is doing family stuff but you know but things at home were just a little bit different yeah yep yeah richard senior he had a drinking problem yep and he was a tough disciplinarian right he didn't he and he didn't manage money too well no when richard was only two years old it was reported that he was force fed by his father yeah i think he bowed up and said he wasn't going to eat yeah yeah, it didn't work out too good. No, for him. he was force fed to eat and, until he vomited. Mm. That ain't cool. And Richard's sister, Pamela, would later recall confrontations between her brother and their father that ended with his, their dad shaking Richard and even throwing him up against the wall. Mm. And the dad would allegedly and well, also emotionally abuse and yell at Richard whenever the, you know he seemed to mess up. Right. Just over the top abuse. Yeah, that comes with that drinking problem. Yeah, it could have been. And then money troubles, too. And I guess there's probably a lot of arguing going on. and Blame getting put in the wrong place sometimes. Yeah, and uh, Richard, Richard's dad and uh, their mom would often fuss yep. right there in front of the kids. Yeah, that ain't cool. And Beatrice, she was had a tendency to accuse Richard of using drugs. But the dad. And uh, infidelity yeah. Also, also. Yeah, there was one time that uh, she even accused of her husband of uh, cheating on them while they were in uh, on a camping trip in Oregon. Well, you know, I guess like he was cheating while they were on the trip. Or yeah. she, she accused him while they were on the trip. No, he, she accused him of cheating while they were on the trip. Oh, oops, yeah. So yeah, on a camping trip. So and then slid out of his sleeping bag and run across the woods or something. Yeah, and got into another sleeping bag somewhere. <laughs> I guess. I, I guess that's but yeah. Okay. Yeah, while they were on a camping trip, you know, she accused him of cheating. So, yeah, that wasn't good at all. So, you know, some kind of va- vacation they were on, it just didn't end well. Yeah. No. With Richard's parents, their preoccupation of their marriage going bad, they paid very little attention to Richard. It don't sound like it's paying attention to a lot of things. Yeah. And this is when his strange behaviors began to come out. Mm. By the time Richard was 10 years old, this was when he developed an interest in dead animals. He liked to kill and torture cats. So he was making them dead. He wasn't just yeah. <laughs> interested in dead. Yeah. And this he, is bad. That's the, ten years old. Ten um, years old. And he liked to kill and torture cats that he found around the neighborhood. And he seemed to be fascinated by their blood and their guts and the inside the way they worked. Yeah, there was your first major red flag. Yep. Mom. <laughs> just another cat out here. And just to... Uh, a little bit later report on Richard, it was determined that he had what they called a McDonald triad, which is three things. One of them is wetting the bed, setting, you know, small fires, setting things on fire, and cruelty to animals. Right. And it said if, you know, if anybody exhibits at least two of these things, they have uh, serial tendencies, violent you, tendencies. You see it in a lot of serial killers. Yes. Especially but, the animal things. But it was determined that he had all three of these. Mm. So he was over the top on his... On his McDonald's or... Yeah. yeah, and we're not talking about a Happy Meal either. <laughs> no, hell no. No. Now, over the, I guess over the next few years, when I guess Richard was about 12, his parents' fighting got to a boiling point, I guess. Yeah. And even his mother saw, went to two different psychiatrists for emotional issues, I guess. Yeah. I guess a lot of fighting and uh, financial troubles. Maybe she's wigged out a little bit Mm -hmm. and when richard was 13 his parents went through an economic hardship and lost their house and this time richard was still having troubling behaviors 
uh, Richard at this time, I guess they were his family had started renting an apartment or a house or something. Yeah, and this is when he started doing a little cooking of his own. Yeah, he had uh, something where he just he just started. Yeah, he just wanted to cook, and uh, but he he wasn't very good at it. So he ended up basically his mother said that he just ended up burning up all the pans and he'd make huge messes and leave stuff poured what? in the floor and wouldn't clean up nothing. And then about the same time, we got to where he would just turn up the heat as high as it go. Yeah, and sit on the couch, and then open up the windows, and then strip off naked and lay on the couch. Yeah, and they, I guess, probably wasn't much of the family getting much sleep there. If he's staying up all night and cooking and sitting, burning up stuff, they're probably worried about burning up a house or something. Mm -hmm. And then he's naked on the couch, getting a little weird. Yep, and this was this was when he was about thirteen years old, and this yeah. was the time when Richard experienced one of his earliest breaks from reality. This one, uh, he actually became convinced that he was a member of the James Younger gang. And this was, Dale, this was a group of outlaws, I guess, from the Jesse James era. Yeah, they rode with Jesse James. Yeah. Frank and, Jan uh, Frank and uh, uh, that's Frank and Jesse. Cole and something younger. Yeah, James Younger gang. Yeah. Well, yeah. James is the Jesse James part. Yeah. yeah. James and Younger gang. It's Cole and somebody I can't remember. Yeah. Go watch Silverado. And he didn't even got a poster made of the gang and had it put in his room so he thought he was reincarnated from yeah okay from that one of them uh, members of the group well hell if i was gonna do that let's go ahead and pick jesse james instead of one of the well, sidekicks somebody you knew yeah you don't want to be a sidekick <laughs> but he repeatedly asked his mom to buy him a cowboy hat i mean do you want to be mr rourke or tattoo come on oh mr tattoo was pretty cool though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, tattoo was yeah. Cool. oh yeah it was cool man i mean you got all the chicks and stuff they played yeah. yeah okay so did uh she buy him the hat no oh yeah and this is about the time he started high school, right? Yep. Okay. And, yeah, it was about this time Richard started high school, and his parents had had enough of each other. They separated, and <laughs> <laughs> Richard's mom took the children to Los Angeles to live with relatives when Richard was in middle school of the ninth grade. Yeah, she just up and took them. Yep. <laughs> and then uh, Richard Sr. went down, I think, what, eight days later? About eight days later, yeah. Got Junior and brought him back, but uh, – Beatrice and uh, Pamela stayed for like four months. Yep. But after four months, they came back home. Right. Now, back at school, Richard was known as Rick to his classmates. Slick Rick. Yep. And he seemed to have no trouble fitting in, I don't think. He was no. pretty popular, just like he was when he was little. Right. He kept himself well-groomed and was very popular. Yep. Even going on a few dates with girls. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think there were two girls uh, in particular he dated seriously and one relationship he had with a girl I, i'm almost thinking her name was libby libby christopher i think and it lasted for about a year i think i'd read that hmm. and but both of these relationships would come to an end with some embarrassing reasons yes yeah, well actually one embarrassing reason yeah now he was attracted to women i was just gonna say an embarrassing reason popped up but i guess it didn't no <laughs> yeah he was attracted to women but yeah. when it came down to actually being intimate with them um, he couldn't express his attraction but pretty much. He, yeah, kind of. yeah, I miss being nice, but he couldn't maintain an erection. Right. Yeah, he had a little bit of ED going on. So back in the 60s, you know, they just didn't have stuff for this. You know? No. Yeah. Well, and this is when he's 15 or 16, too. It's not like he's yeah. 65. Yeah. So. And Richard seemed to be pretty humiliated by this. Oh, well, I'm sure. Yeah. it would be crushing, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. And he was... It seemed to be he was very underweight and impotent, and he began to feel weak and broken. I think his, you know, his him having ED became a point of obsession for him. Oh yeah, and almost like a, it just got into his head and it just it bothered him a lot. I think that was one of the the main things that you know sort of turned him at this point. Yeah, I mean, he had some bad stuff happen already, but damn. But now, <laughs> now Dale in Richard's mind. His ED was caused by a lack of blood. Yeah, I've heard that in a couple, a couple places. I'm not sure that's completely yep. true, but it would make sense, I guess, in, yep. the, in his mind. Yeah, but now his reasoning was the only us was well. Of course, it's probably this about time for biology class and all that mess, and so I'm sure that's what they were telling him, and that's where for first thing he thought. Well, yeah, yeah, but that's yeah, I, guess I must he, be low. <laughs> he didn't he didn't research it too well because. He thought he needed to consume blood of animals because hmm. he had a lack of blood. Yeah. I don't know what was going through his mind and at this point. But now we got to keep in mind, too, that when Richard was in school, 
he didn't his grades weren't that great. He made C's, D's, and F's. Yeah, he just did just enough to get by. Just yes. to, yeah, probably on purpose. Yeah, just to what he needed to do. Yeah, and then when all that stuff happened with the the ED and all that, then he kind of just you know he's got in trouble for some drugs. I wonder if he just started trying all that stuff out too. To could have been. Of course, it was the sixties, so. A lot of drugs. A lot of drugs going around at parties. Yeah. A lot of drugs and probably easy accessible to, to a lot of drugs. Yep, and he was still popular in school and enough enough popular to be invited to parties still. Yeah. And but he began to drink. Right. And I think it was at one party he ended up drinking too much and his behavior got erratic and he was running down the street screaming and making noises that nobody could understand. And one of his friends I guess they got concerned and took him home. But Richard finally confided in him that, you know, about his impotence. And it was, I guess, taking an even more deeper toll on him than he let on. I'm sure. And then the sophomore year, he got in trouble for, he got arrested for marijuana. Yep. So things are starting to unravel here. Yep. He, you have to say he got taken LSD and, and amphetamines. Mm-hmm. He was just dabbling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But then, even though he had the crappy grades, he did uh, enroll in uh, American River College in in uh, 1968. Mm-hmm. And then, once he got into school, he maintained as a, a C average, so he's doing better actually in college than he did in high school. And then, but he he was still doing drugs. And then that's finally when he decided to uh, to see a psychiatrist to see if he could help him with his his erectile dysfunction. Yeah. But like you said, in the 60s, there wasn't a whole lot they could do for it. No. Basically, just told him it was probably from some suppressed anger or some other kind of mental illness. I'm sure that's what he wanted to hear. Yeah, he didn't want to hear that at all. Mm. And this psychiatrist, that now they even suspected this, Richard was mentally ill, but not so much that he needed an intervention. And ultimately, this was, was no help to Richard at all, who still believed that his body was low on blood. And pretty much as time went on, he suffered quietly, he grew his hair long, and began to neglect his hygiene. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't take a bath and... He just very disheveled. Now, is this whole time, is he still killing cats and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. Or do we know? Yeah, it's assumed that he was. Okay. And he lived in filth and began to withdraw more and more from other people. And his friends stopped coming by his house. I guess he was known as Stinky then, I guess. Is this why he's in college yet? Yeah. Okay. And his father was worried about him, and his mother, she thought nothing of his looks. She didn't even really care, I don't right. think. And she thought, you know, it's the 60s, it's the hippies. Right. And I guess about this time is when he decided he was going to take a year off from, from college. Yeah. And, well, I think he, what did he tell the college? He was just going to take a, he didn't say I'm going to take a year off. He just, he just quit going, I guess. Yeah. So they kicked him out of college. Instead of going home, he ended up on the uh, front lawn of uh, some friends. Well, it wasn't really friends. It was just uh, these people would looked out their their, uh, their door one day and this guy's sitting out in the grass and they go out and talk to him and end up moving in with them mm-hmm. in a small apartment was it apartment or was it a house it was a house yeah, yeah. they all rented together and then that's when his paranoia started jacking up a lot he'd go in and board up his room board up the door of his room they, they thought people were trying to get him or something didn't he yeah he said he even uh, went in the back of his closet and knocked the wall out so he'd have another way to get in so nobody could sneak up on him yep so he's really, and he was still staying high all the time. Said he would uh, just do whatever he wanted to. He'd come out, come out of his room, walk around naked. And even if they had come near, if they didn't, it, it didn't, didn't matter. matter. Yeah, no, he's doing some weird stuff. So they kind of figured that you know, I don't, I don't believe this is going to work out because he wouldn't take a bath, he wouldn't brush his teeth, he's nasty, he's walking around naked, smoking dope all the time. And uh, that's when they said they was going to ask him to move out. And he refused. Yeah. So he's like, okay. So they packed up their shit and they left. <laughs> so he, he couldn't pay the rent then. Right. So then he had to move out. He had, he had to go back and back to the parents' house, I guess. Yeah, back to live with his mama. Back to the rents. Yep. And it was shortly after this, I think it was a year later, that uh, Richard's parents separated. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was 1972. May of 72. Yeah. Then on in November of 72, when Richard was 22... His parents finally, they finalized divorce, and he was maintained, well, he maintained his time between father and mother. Right. So he was just going back and forth. And he went on a, a journey, like a solitary journey, to Utah and was arrested and put in jail for a traffic violation. Yeah. 
he went up there for a while i think you know he was already having problems because he didn't have no money he wouldn't work and what he did he didn't keep a job for long he, all he did was kept um, rounding up traffic tickets and he kept driving kept rounding up traffic tickets then he went on this trip and he got caught with more traffic tickets and then uh i think they impounded his car i think he had his dogs with him stuff he put his dogs in the shelter and locked yeah. him up and and then uh, i think his mom or whatever had to go get him and get his car back and pay all his fines it was like five hundred dollars yeah. in, in fines or something to get him out which was a shit ton then but i yeah. think after this is when he really starts getting ramping say, up just a little bit more yeah i don't want to say weird but yeah ramping up because he started saying that he thought the cops done something to him yeah you know either they had given him something or they had fixated him or they had done he kept just saying that they had done something to him and he could feel his body was different they had done something to him yeah he seemed to have a little bit of schizophrenia going on yeah at this point it's starting to break out pretty yep. strong yeah it had been also reported about this time that he felt that he had a a lack of vitamin c yeah and he reportedly pressed whole oranges to his skin around his forehead and be- he believed that his brain would absorb the nutrient nutrients directly like you know through osmosis yeah i guess after that that return from the police station that's how he's gonna get fixed yeah and one of his strangest and most powerful delusions involved his skull he be- he actually felt that his cranial bones had split apart and began to shift beneath his skin mm. like you know changes into pieces like a kind of like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle in a way right and he even shaved his head to try to see their movements so yeah he was going through some tough stuff in april of 1973 dale he was attending a friend's apartment party and richard was caught fondling a girl and then was asked to leave well, i'm guessing yeah and after his return to his apartment the cops arrived to escort him out and yeah, he, well he left and then he came back yeah yeah and then, then uh that's when uh you know they called the cops and when the cops come in to escort him out they grabbed him up and a gun fell out of his belt yeah 22 caliber right so they took him to jail and his father come bailed him out again yep but after this in about the next month i think they were gonna Send him off to live with his grandmother for a while. Yeah, she lived in Los Angeles. Right. And he continued to complain of false head injuries and other illnesses. And just a few months later, she couldn't tolerate him. No, she said, you know, sometimes she would come home. said they didn't even talk a lot, you know. And he was still the same way. He had weird habits and non-grooming and all this stuff. And said sometimes she would come home and he'd be standing on his head in the corner. And we're like, what are you doing? I'm trying to get the blood to go back in my head because there's all these headaches yeah you know, so he thought he could could uh, fix them and you know, all this time you know i guess it, because of his ed he thought he had low blood yeah so he didn't have enough to do everything at one time i guess yeah i guess like not having enough ram in your computer you just you can't run everything at one time i don't know <laughs> i guess that's what he was thinking he couldn't ram <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah i guess he didn't have enough juice to make it all run <laughs> Okay. <laughs> His batteries were low. Oh, yeah, they were. All right. Enough of that. Yeah. Now, it was still he kept seeing doctors for his head injuries and stomach aches, and he also seen a, seen a neurologist who concluded he had a psychic disturbance of major proportions. Yeah, a neurologist. Yeah, this was in 73. So, you know, it's kind of showing that he's not afraid to go to a doctor. He just goes and <laughs> tells them some crazy shit. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like okay <laughs> you know when you when you come in and you shave your head and you tell them your skull's coming apart and moving around and you shave your head so you can sit and look in the mirror and watch it and see what's going what's going on you got some stuff you got some bad stuff going yeah, on. yeah there's some serious what was it epic proportion yeah epic major pro- proportion. major proportions yes. yes and finally in december of 73 this is when he entered the american river hospital this was in sacramento and he told doctors and nurses someone had stolen his pulmonary artery man that sucks when that happens oh yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. all his blood flow had stopped yep and he was admitted to the psychiatric ward and yet his mother took well, him out later yeah so they should have just left him in there she just left him in there man let him help him i mean yeah. my goodness i know this is the 60s and it was probably not very much they were doing but 
besides giving him some kind of strong drugs or something. But, but his mo- mother and father were just convinced that he was using drugs. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sure he was. Yeah, but it didn't help with him being a little bit schizophrenic. No, no. They probably just multiplied it. And in 1976, when Richard was about 25, he was hospitalized at Beverly Manor. And he was committed as a schizophrenic suffering from somatic delusions. Right. And he's... St- he still teetered back and forth between his mother and father's house, and at about this time, he went on welfare to receive extra spending money. So is this after he got out of the hospital, I guess? Yes. I think it was about this time he got in a, a pretty bad argument with his mother. Yeah, they had gotten into it in, uh, about something, and I'm not sure it was, you know, because he went from just being hard to get along with to, to kind of violent, and she was afraid of him. And... uh they got into it, and she picked up the phone because she was going to call the cops, and he just jerked the phone out of her hand and smacked her in the head with it. Knocked, knocked her down. Her down. Yeah. But uh, it was said it was pretty wild, dude, because she actually did get the number completed before before he'd done that. So the cops came, but he'd already ran because he, he realized that the phone call went through. Yep. And just to remind everybody, you know, all this time, Richard was still killing animals and stuff right. and consuming blood. Yeah, because when he got out of that hospital – they got him an apartment that was on his own. When he got out of Beverly Manor, you know, and they got him an apartment on his own, right? Yeah, because he couldn't get along with them. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, once they got out of Beverly Manor, and uh, I guess they had got him on some medication and stuff, but I guess it didn't matter if she just smacked his mom to the floor or whatever. But uh, Yeah, he couldn't live with them at all. So they got him his own apartment to get him out, and then they'd help him pay rent or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And this was when, um, you know, he, when he was in his own apartment, his father came to see him and he found richard very ill well he went to see him the day before you know because his father didn't want him to just basically be alone all the time so he would go by pretty pretty regularly and uh visit him and they had went over there or he had went over there the night before and uh, they had played chess and some other stuff and didn't seem nothing out of the ordinary except for the house is wrecked and pretty raunchy but uh, he did notice there were some rabbits around and wondered what was going on. And uh, Richard had been going to a farm, a local farm, and buying rabbits. And he asked him what the rabbits for, and he said he was eating the rabbits. Yeah. But he said, you know, whatever, you know, I guess they're used to him saying crazy stuff and whatever. But nothing really out of the ordinary happened. So that night he left. Well, the next morning, or the next day, well, I'm not sure what the timetable was, he decided he'd go back and check on him again. And that's when he come in and I knocked on the door, and uh, he wouldn't answer. So he went in and then found him extremely ill. Yeah, and he'd uh, actually found that Richard had injected himself with rabbit's blood. Yeah. So he got blood poisoning. Idiot. Yeah. I guess because he, he figured that his blood was low, like we said. Yeah, so he was filling up. Mm-hmm. So they took him to the hospital, and he told... Back to the American River Hospital. Yes. And uh, they had, he had told the doctors that actually what happened is he had eaten a rabbit that had battery acid in his stomach. Yes. <laughs> so I'm sure that's, that goes over a little better than I've been injecting rabbit blood into my veins. But So he was buying these rabbits, and he was killing them and drinking their blood or injecting their blood or both. Mm-hmm. And... Well, actually, what he was really doing is he was injecting the blood, and he was drinking the blood, and he was ripping out their entrails and stomachs and intestines and putting them in a blender and making sludge, uh, slushies and, and drinking them. Yep. So, told you it's going to get bad. Yeah, it's, it's going to get a lot worse. Though. Yeah. This is just the beginning. Yep. But he seemed, he escaped from the American River Hospital after doctors wouldn't consent to releasing him, and they considered him a danger to others. Um, that was right. And that's in air quotes. <laughs> yep. And the next day, transferred from American River Hospital to an extended care mental hospital. And Richard believed he was there for food poisoning, and housekeepers continued to find dead birds outside of his window. Yeah, he was mad. You know, he said that, uh, I don't know why I'm in a, a mental institution, or, I'm, you know, I'm, here, I'm just here for food poisoning because i ate a bad rabbit but he was catching dead he was catching birds outside of his window yeah and eating eating the birds yeah so he find him with his he said his face and shirt covered in blood where he tore the bird's head off and just poured it all over him and they asked him what happened he said he cut himself shaving mm. 
piece of <laughs> but I have a have a gallon of blood down your shirt. Um, right. And it was too. also rumored that he had got a hold of some ranges while in this hospital as well and was taking blood from the dogs that they had in there that was a uh, what do you call them? Like the therapy dogs. Therapy dogs, yeah. That they had that uh, the therapy dogs he would uh, stick the needle in them and draw blood from them and inject them himself to put the dog's blood to. Yeah. Man, he's crazy. He's obsessed. Yes. Crazy is, yes. <laughs> Convinced he didn't have enough blood. And he was getting a plenty. Yep. But in September of 76, he was released from the mental hospital with the same diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. Right. And Richard moved into his own apartment and... So his parents continued to pay for bills and his groceries. Right. So they were t- they were keeping him up. Now at this point, they had given him some some major drugs, and he was starting to get a lot better. As far as his uh, what he was doing now, getting a lot better in 1976 was on some major drugs. Like basically, his mom said he was almost like a zombie. Yeah. You know, and he was just and she didn't like that. Zoned out. Yep. It was better to have him as a zombie than a vampire. Yeah. So the court ordered a uh, conservatorship, you know, when he got out. They were to look after him, make sure his bills were paid, buy him his groceries and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. she would go by and see him, you know. And even though he was, you know, he was easy to, to be around, uh, she just couldn't stand the fact that he was like a zombie. So she took it on her own to start weaning him off this medicine. Yeah. Another brilliant move by the mother. So, you know what happens as soon as he gets weaned off a little bit and he's back to full strength. His uh, fascination with blood comes back again. With a vengeance. Yep. Yep. And he begins capturing, killing small animals again. And, like I said, he'd eat them raw or blend their organs. And buying dogs. Yep. 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 So, anyway, I guess. uh, And then in 76, the conservatorship expires, basically. So he's on his own. Mm Mm-hmm. You know. All the all the chains are off, and he's just going to be able to do what he wants. Now, it was in June of 77, this is when Richard's mother, she helped him plan and gave him $1,450 for a trip to Washington. And he stayed there for about three weeks and bought a 1966 Ford Ranchero wagon. This looks like an El Camino. Right, but it's a Ford. Yeah, and he bought it for $800 from a man in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. This kind of weird. Isn't it? They live in Sacramento. How far is it to Colorado to buy a car to go to Washington? It's pretty good ways. <laughs> pretty good ways. On August the 3rd of 1977, when Richard was 27, police officers of the Bureau of Indian Affairs found Richard's Ford Ranchero near Pyramid Lake Reservation in Nevada. And they police found a 22 caliber and a 30-30 rifle and had taken the liver from a cow and smeared blood all over his naked body. Yeah, said they were there. Well, actually, they had come up on the, the car. A guy had seen the the ranchero. It got stuck in the sand, and uh, he come up on it after Richard had abandoned the car and went down through the woods and said he he thought he had a dog with him, but he wasn't sure. And uh, when he walked up and looked inside his car, that's when he saw the, the rifles and blood all over, and there was a bucket with a liver in it and all that stuff. And so he called the the Bureau of Indian Affairs when when they came out. They were like, oh, shit, you know, and seen this this big gory mess, wondering what was going on, and started got to looking around. And then they seen him, you know, was like a mile, three-quarter miles, standing off. They were looking in binoculars out there, and he was blood-covered and naked. Mm-hmm. So they had to go, and uh, he took off running, but they run him down and caught him. Yeah. They never did see the dog again, so they don't know what happened to it. But here's another time when they got him but they they did check the blood and the liver and it was uh, come from a cow so, yeah. so apparently he had, he had killed a cow so I guess rabbits and dogs wasn't enough wasn't enough he's moving on up he's moving on up yep. and he's going to continue to move on up yep and so but anyway they didn't U.S. Attorney didn't really see much they could prosecute him for besides you know maybe um, being naked when he go uh obscene what is it anyway they, they decided that there wasn't nothing i mean the blood was from an animal you know and just i guess the guns were his and you know, the truck was his and then so they decided they didn't want to prosecute and he was just basically free to go so you mean you're telling me you can actually walk out in public with animal blood on you and you're you're fine i reckon 
Who knew? On Indian land in 1977. Who knew? Yeah, you're probably just like, well, we're not going to keep this guy. <laughs> let yeah, him go let back him go. home. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. don't need him here. And I think, uh, actually, when he called his mom to come get him and, you know, tell him what the deal was, and then his dad actually come to pick him up, and he said yeah, it was just a big understanding that uh, he had accidentally spilled some rabbit blood on him, and it was just a misunderstanding. Yep. And it's like, all's good, and so they take him home. <laughs> yep. Not that, oh, really? Rabbit blood? Mm, yeah, that happens to me every day. My yep. bad. <laughs> now, it was just a little bit later that year, October to November, this is when he purchased and stole some dogs. And he even got to... I mean, Sarah McLaughlin would be fucking all yeah. the hell on this. Yeah, and he got to calling and harassing the families of a dog he had stolen. Yeah. Well, you know, he bought a couple of dogs from the SPCA. Yeah. For pretty cheap, 15 bucks or whatever. And uh, I guess he'd take him home and kill them blended and blended and blooded and whatever and then uh i think he had bought another one uh somebody else had a dog and he bought for like 25 dollars. he tried to talk them down and they wouldn't but he bought it anyway but he just didn't have the money to keep us up so he stole the neighbor's dog and when he seen the ad in the paper about the the missing dog he actually called him and, and yeah. harassed him about it you know of course That's a sick was, individual man. there's no caller id or nothing so they don't know who's calling and when the guy the dad got on the phone and demanded to find out who this is he just hung up you know yep but, yeah that's pretty bad <laughs> yep and he'd also one of his other neighbors was uh selling lab puppies for 10 bucks a piece so he went over there and acted like he was a, a breeder but is that the guy noticed that he never did check the sex of the dogs. We just bought three of them and took them. Mm-hmm. And then later he found them dead on his yard, you know, laying in his yard. So yep. he had taken them and used them for what he wanted and threw them back out there. Yeah. So he, he don't really give a shit. You mm-hmm. know, he's not trying to hide much. You and know? I, I even read and heard that he looked at animals like they were just machines for blood for him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, rabbits and, uh, cats and dogs. They just provided him blood. Just another bag of blood. Yep. Mm. Now it was in December of that same year of seventy seven, Richard buys a twenty two caliber semi automatic pistol for about seventy bucks cash. But he had to I guess he had a permit or uh had to get a Well he he would they said he had gotten uh it was kinda of weird because uh, that's the first time I've seen the uh what he gave for the gun because it said he had got him a job at a paint store. But it only lasts like 10 days. He yeah. said he had saved up his money on his paychecks. I'm like, how many damn paychecks you get for 10 days? But he had saved up, you know, the money that he made, and he went and bought that gun. He didn't have to have a permit or anything. All they did, they asked him, has he ever been into a mental institution? And he said no. So they said, okay, and sold him the gun. Yeah. But he couldn't take it right then. He did have to wait, you know. But mm-hmm. so, so it was a waiting period, but, yeah, it just – as long as you say no, buddy, we're good to go. Mm-hmm. Sign yeah. here. Now, it was sometime, Dale, around the 1st of December. Richard got to sh- driving around neighborhoods and just with this pistol he had bought, just shooting into random houses. Yep. And it was one house he went by, he shot into, and it just, the woman's name was Mrs. Polinsky. Right. She and, was uh, standing there doing her dishes. Yep. Looking when, out the window. <laughs> yeah, when she heard something buzz by her head. Yep. And she had realized later that a bullet had pierced through the bun in her hair. Yep. Came through the, well, I guess she realized when the window busted. (laughs) But, you know, it shot through the window, went right through her hair. Yep. And lodged in the the wall behind her. Yeah. So she was that close. Yep. To being uh, his first human victim. Yep. So he he had got that pistol to ramp up his. Yep his needs so you know it's kind of weird you know to me because you know at that party he had a gun and then when they uh when his car got stuck he had a car full of guns but then he had to go buy another gun maybe, yeah you reckon maybe they took his guns they could have been yeah maybe that, that makes sense yep. but you know he, he went in and told him you know he hadn't been nowhere or whatever or hadn't been in no institution and waited whatever it was two or three weeks and got his as soon as he got his gun started riding around yeah his wrench yep Yep, she was very lucky. Yep, and we're going to stop here on this episode, and this will be the end of part one, because, Dale, we get into part two, 
it's going to get even worse. Yeah. And Richards is really going to ramp up his his killing spree uh, from going from animals like birds, rabbits, cats, and dogs to cows. Yeah, and to humans. To humans. Yeah, and it's going to get worse. Yeah, way worse. So you know, we we'll just want everybody before part two that you know his his antics are going to get bad. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll have part two out next week, bud. All right, Dan. All right. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is The Crack House Chronicles. Chronicles. Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man that says he has nothing to apologize for, but he's working on it. (laughs) It's Dale. Yeah, that's the damn truth. Yep. I'm going to stack them up. Yeah. It seems like like us guys always have to have something to apologize for. We're just not happy. Yeah, that's right. We're just sorry to be sorry. I think we're conditioned that way. (laughs) Yeah. Because if you're not apologizing for something... There's something going to happen. You missed out on something. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on, bud? What's happening? Man, it's a beautiful day. Isn't it? Man, and we're in here recording. I'm telling you, it's kind of odd, dude. We, we got to get it in when you got to get it in. That's it. Yeah. You got any good shout outs for us today, bud? Yeah, we got a few. We want to, you know, we've uh, said some stuff about uh, some of our followers on Instagram and some of our followers on Facebook, but today we're going to jump over to the YouTube channel. We've had some good comments come in. We want to thank the John Smith yet again handle there. Gave us a good comment on uh, the Brenda Spencer episode that just dropped on youtube and uh the dale dinwiddie had a good compliment from uh peppermint so we really like to thank you guys for leaving comments for us out there on the youtube channel absolutely we appreciate everybody that you know listens to us and checks us out and be sure to go to apple podcast and leave us a rating review click that five star button that's right it really helps a lot go to youtube subscribe hit the little bell thing we've just busted fifty thousand views on uh on the youtube so uh, it's pretty amazing. Yep. And it's good stuff, man. Check out our store page. Get you a T-shirt. Get you a mug. Get you some kind of crack house merchandise. Yeah, get you some stuff. Jump over to the Facebook thing. Hit the like there, man. We're almost at 1,000. It's killing me. We got to get up there. Yeah. I, mean, I think we're, we're a little over 900, so surely we can... We can get a thousand. Share our our post on there. Maybe we we'll get a thousand. Maybe I'll do some kind of cool giveaway or something. We do now need to have a cool giveaway pretty soon. We do. We got right. some cool fans. They deserve it. All right, but we're going to get into our case this week, and we are doing part two of Richard Trenton Chase. Before we get into this, we want to go ahead and tell you now, uh, if you thought part one was going to get a little rough, you ain't heard shit yet, because <laughs> it's going to get a little little bad today. This guy is pretty bad. Yeah. So He's the worst I've read about and yeah. heard about. So. We'll give you a little heads up before we get to the, the real, real bad parts, but they're going to come quick. If blood, gore, and stuff like that makes you squeamish, then this is not for you. Yeah, maybe we'll see you next week. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but, but otherwise, you know, me and Donnie are pretty committed, and we we like to we'll drop into details when they're there to, to do, and sometimes they're hard to say and hard to read and hard to hear, but oh well. This Somebody's got to do it. Yep. <laughs> this this is the this is the way he was. I mean, this is what, what happened to him. This, That's right. So we're gonna get into it, bud. All right, let's and roll. Just to summarize a little bit from part one, okay. just just for a minute here, you know, we talk about Richard. You know, he had a pretty pretty good young childhood. You he know, did. going in, um, he was in Cub Scouts, played little league baseball, and just everything was going good. And you know, his dad got to drinking and got abusive. His mom was having some mental issues. Yep. And, you know, he had a sister, and well, his dad had some infidelity going on and got into his teenage years, and he found out that he had a little bit of a erectile dysfunction going on. Yeah. And I think that's what really brought on a lot of his m- mental illness. He yeah. was uh, diagnosed as a schizophrenic, a paranoid schizophrenic. He believed that his body was low on blood. Yeah. 
and which was really causing he thought was causing his erectile dysfunction. I think he thought that was causing a lot of stuff. Yeah. People were stealing his organs and his stomach was upside down and he he, he thought a lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot of really weird stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know, he tried to help himself by going to the doctor a lot and telling them and I'm sure he got some nice looks when he went in there and told him what he thought was going on, but he was trying. He just didn't realize how sick he was, I don't think. Yep. And then every time he would do something or they would make some advances in it, you know, it seemed like his mom or his dad would come along and and it would just revert right back. Yeah. You know, like, you know, she they got him on some meds and she didn't like the way he was kind of zombied out and she weaned him off of those and then he yeah. went back full power to crazy land. And he got to consuming the blood of animals. Yeah. Rabbits, dogs, and cats. Um, thinking, you know, that would help his low blood problem. Yeah. And so, even inject himself with animal blood and um, getting sick. Yeah, he was blood infection. making uh, purees and uh, smoothies out of parts. I mean, he was doing all kind of stuff to try to fix his blood problem. You know, either where he thought he was really low or his, at one time he was even thinking his blood was turning to dust. You know, he just, he had something in his head bad was just telling him all this stuff was yep. going on. So he had some bad psychological stuff going on, no and doubt then, about you it. You know, and then they would have problems and then sometimes he would act normal, you know, like even... Right before everything really went crazy, he come in and had his hair fixed, and he had, you know, cleaned up his beard and was talking about getting his job. And his dad take him out shopping and went and bought him. He was wanting this orange, was like a ski jacket, right? Like a yeah. down ski jacket. So his dad bought him his jacket, and everything was really cool. And and just a couple of days later, I think that's when his sister had said something about uh, she really didn't want him to come home for Christmas, right? Yeah. And his mama had called him, and uh. It told him, you know, really, we just don't think you should come home for Christmas. And I think that really is what set off mm-hmm. the second part of this, uh, all this mayhem. Yeah, that was the later end of December of 77. Yeah. 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 So about where we're getting ready to start, it was, all this happened right in there. You know, everything was good and then some crazy stuff. Because right after, you know, right after she told him he didn't want him to come home for Christmas, she heard a knocking outside her door. And she thought it was the cat, but it was too loud. So she figured, man, well, maybe it was him. And she just didn't really want to see him at this point. And then she heard a loud, loud bang. When yeah. He had shot her cat on the front porch and brought it in the house. And threw it. <laughs> so he was not happy about getting, not getting home home for Christmas. So yep. I think that really set off a lot of this craziness that's getting ready to, to drop on you guys. And this that's when he went on that shooting spree and mm-hmm. shot into the home of uh, Dorothy Polinsky, the we mentioned at the end of last episode. Right, and so that would bring us to where we're we getting ready to start right now. Yep. Now, on uh, December the 29th of 1977, this is when Richard Chase gets into his first victim. And it was really a, just a, a drive-by shooting, Dale. And they said it was just almost kind of like a warm-up for his crimes he planned on committing. And his first victim was a man named Ambrose Griffin. Yeah. And he was a 51-year-old engineer, a father of two, and he was helping his wife bring in some groceries. Yeah, they just got home from uh, getting groceries and uh, pulled in, and I think he gave his wife the keys to open up the trunk, and you know, because you needed that at that time. Yeah. <laughs> Not now. You actually had two keys yeah. for your car. <laughs> yeah, one for the trunk, one for the ignition. Yeah. And uh, so she opened up, and they started carrying the groceries in, and I think his daughter-in-law was holding the door for him and stuff, and... He went to go get the last bag of groceries, and about this time is when uh, that Ford Ranchero come rolling by. Yep. And uh, he does uh, more or less like a drive-by shooting. Yep, and uh, shot him with the twenty two caliber mm-hmm. right in the chest yep. and, and killed him. And killed him. So that was his, his first human murder. But now one of uh, Ambrose Griffin's sons, he reported seeing a neighbor walking around their East Sacramento neighborhood with a twenty two rifle earlier in the week and the neighbor's rifle was seized but ballistics determined that it was not the murder weapon right and uh it was also determined that the 22 used to kill ambrose griffin was the same one that was used to fire into uh dorothy polinsky's right home. yeah so they they discounted the neighbor's gun but they did figure out the 22 that killed mr griffin was the same one that was found in the kitchen so it seems like they're they're getting close they're leaking th- things up but it's not no, you know, they're not finding not. who's doing this. You know, and you'd think, you know, because he's already creeping around a little bit here in the neighborhoods. He, I'm sure he's looking a little rough. Yep. So, you know, especially if he's wearing that orange jacket, <laughs> it's not going to be hard to spot. Now, just a, about a week, week and a half later, this is on January the 11th of 78, Richard asked a neighbor for a cigarette. And when they wouldn't give him, you know, the cigarette, he forcibly restrained them. 
until he gave him the entire pack. No, he said they uh, actually had offered him a cigarette, but he still didn't move. Just stood there and stared at him. So yeah. then he gave him the whole pack, and then they ran because he freaked him out. Yeah. I don't blame him. I would too. <laughs> yeah. This guy's creepy looking. Yep. Now, just two weeks later, you know, some serial killers, Dale, they, it takes them years and years to build up to different levels of killing and crime and, you know, what they do to their victims. But Richard did this, all of his stuff, in less than a month. Yeah. And the things we're going to talk about takes place within a month's time. Yeah, a lot of times it takes, you know, I don't know, almost a lifetime, you know. For, yeah. Like to go from, like, fires and stuff and then start killing small animals and then, you know, eventually fantasizing about all this stuff to get to where they finally kill a human, but not him. No, it's, it's a month. Yeah. And this is probably part of his uh, paranoid schizophrenic. Yeah, kicking yeah. in hard. Now, two weeks later, he attempted to enter the home of another woman and finding that her doors were locked, he went to her backyard and walked away. But said that uh, you know he was he had walked up and she was in the house and she saw him. Yeah. And he was trying her windows and trying her doors, but he didn't see her. But she was like looking at him. You know, he was freaking her out, right? Mm-hmm. She's checking and said, and then she went to the back door. And by the time he got to the back door, and they were staring face to face. Yeah. And he's looked at her, you know, and she wouldn't let him in. And said he just stared at her for a minute and then just walked away, walked through her backyard and out the gate. Yeah. Back into the neighborhood. And said she called the cops, but the time he got there, he was already gone. But, you know, that would be some freaky stuff, man. Now, I've heard of, from different places that it was part of Richard's schizophrenia that, you know, if he would go to a house and the door was locked, then he would just assume that he wasn't invited in. Yeah. yeah but if the door was unlocked, that was his way of saying, oh, I'm, I'm okay to go in. Yeah, come on in. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like, like uh, you know. I mean, I'm invited if, if if you're not locked up I'm invited to come in it's, yeah. it's your own fault basically yeah pretty much that's what he was thinking <laughs> yeah you know and about this time just right in the same time you know the neighbors are still reporting that they see Richard carrying dogs and cats and rabbits a lot of stuff in his home at this still the same time and they never ever see him come out yeah dogs and so, animals never leave the house right so he's still doing all this mess while he's escalating yeah and he went down the street and he broke into a the home of a young married couple and stole some of their valuables and different things and yeah. opened up their, I guess, their dresser drawers and whatnots. And it was this time, Dale, he urinated into a drawer that belonged to their infant. It had their infant's clothing in it, and he defecated on their son's bed. Yeah, that was uh, Robert and Barbara Edwards. And, yep. and they actually came home and caught him in the house and walked in and see him face to face and lucky to live. Yeah, you know, knowing what's how it, what, you know how we're going from here, but yeah, then what do you think about that? What the hell was he? <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. Not unless he thought they were home. So uh, yeah. he just went in and was robbing their house, I guess, and then figured I'll just take a dump while I'm here. The husband attacked him, but uh, Richard did escape. Yeah, kind of reminds you of uh, Ramirez, you know. Yeah, he was able to get out. Yeah, you know when he'd go in and do somebody's house, if somebody tried to get on, he would run away. But, mm-hmm. You know. But, yeah, I think uh, that couple was kind of lucky in there because it could have went way worse. But, yeah, he ran away. They never caught him for that. Just 30 minutes later, after this encounter in this house where he went in and took the dump on the bed, he uh, had went to a store. I'm not sure how far away this place was, but he was at a store and uh, said he was going to get a drink or something. And he runs into Nancy Holden. Nancy Holden. Who was a, a girl he knew from school? And said, but uh, he. I walked, think he went to high school together. Yeah, and uh, said he walked up to her and just straight out of the blue he goes, "Were you on the motorcycle when Kurt was killed?" Yeah. And she looked at him. And now Kurt was her boyfriend in high school, who was killed in a motorcycle accident, but she had no clue who this guy was. Yeah, because I guess he had changed a lot since high yeah, school. Yeah, because you know if you look at the pictures, is a. I was going to say random, but it's not random. It's a, a really big difference of what he looked like between then and now. But when he asked who he was, he said, you know, his name was Rick. And uh, so then she realized who he was, and she kind of freaked her out. Because he did go by Rick Chase in school. Yeah. Yep. So it kind of freaked her out. So she kind of just blew him off, you know. It was like, you know, that's kind of a really weird way to come up and say hello. Said, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Remember me? But no. Yeah. Were you on the motorcycle when he was killed? But uh, so she just, you know, kind of blew him off, you know, as a high school friend or whatever. Kind of, just, it really freaked her out in a way. Yeah, so she just went on. But ever so randomly, he would come back up to her in the store, kind of like he was 
bumping into her randomly on each aisle or something. Yeah. And even when she got in the checkout line, he was behind her. So now she's starting to get freaked yeah, out. Yeah, he was stalking her, no doubt about it. So she knew she had to, to do something. So when she checked out, she just ran at her car. And uh, she got in the car and locked the door. But when he, or she don't even know she got the door locked. She ran and got in the car and started up. And he grabbed for the door handle. And she pulled off before he got it. Yeah. Now, whether it was locked or not, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, so she luckily escaped being him. Now, whether he was just wanting to ride back or whatever or not, but I wouldn't think so at this point in his mental condition. Yeah, especially him ramping up. Yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty freaky little incident there that happened in that store. So, yeah, he was definitely stalking her. Yep. Now, Dale, just a few days later, Richard was continuing to break into homes or, intem- or attempting to break into homes, and he, he came across the home of David and Teresa Wallen. Mm-hmm. Now, David was at work. And Teresa was in the middle of taking garbage out. Yeah. And she left the front door unlocked. Yeah, she went to go get another bag, I think. Yeah. And Richard surprised her and shot her three times. Yeah, she turned. She was taking the garbage out, and she went to go get the last bag, I believe. And when she turned around, he stood right in front of her, raised his gun, and shot her three times. And once was in the hand. I think it was almost like a defensive wound. Yeah. And twice in the head. Yeah, she threw her hand up, and he shot her through and the hand. It was killing her. Yeah. And it was the same gun used to kill Ambrose Griffin mm. that they determined. Now, Richard dragged her body into the bedroom. Okay, here we go. <laughs> what? Gore alert. Yep. Okay, that's the last one we're going to give you. Because <laughs> yep. it's going to get worse from here on out. Now, Richard dragged her body into the bedroom, and he raped her post-mortem. Yeah. While repeatedly stabbing her with the butcher knife. Yeah, he said he stabbed her so hard it cracked her sternum, and the blade was actually coming out of her back. Yeah. And when he had finished, he carved her body open and removed several of the internal organs and using a bucket to collect the blood and then taking it to the bathroom, and he bathed in it. Yeah. And then he sliced off her left nipple and drank her blood. And while he had been in the kitchen, I guess going through the house, he found an empty yogurt container Yeah. there on the counter or something. And he used it as a drinking glass. Yeah, I think he was using this as he was taking her, dragging her back. Because, you know, there's so the photos. There's to see where that cup was set down several times. So he was like, probably from the bullet wounds, maybe. Yeah. Just collecting what was. Uh, but he was using this empty yogurt cup as a as a drinking glass yeah. for her blood. Right. Yep. And before he left, he went out into the yard. And Dale, he found a pile of dog feces. And he returned to her body. And stuffed her mouth and throat with the dog feces. What the hell? Yeah. So he's just building up. It's getting, it's getting worse. So, yeah. Yeah, this one here is pretty rough. Yeah. Yeah, and she was three months pregnant. Damn. Yeah, that's pretty rough there. You know, and I mean, all the stuff that he did was basically what he was doing to the animals, but I don't, I don't really get the part about the the dog feces yeah i don't know that's just him degrading her a step Even further more, yeah guess. no doubt about it mm. but right after that happened on january the 23rd this was just a few days later it was just actually two days after he killed Teresa wallen richard bought two puppies from a neighbor and then he killed them and drank their blood and he threw the bodies of the dogs on the, their front yard so he, front just, yard, yeah. he just can't get enough at this point yeah and it's just, I mean, it's every day he's doing something. Hmm, it's crazy. Now, on January the 27th, this is when Richard committed his final murder, which really also qualifies as a mass murder. Yeah. He entered the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Miroth, and she was babysitting her 22-month-old nephew, David. But also there in the home was Evelyn's six-year-old son, Jason. And a neighbor was there by the name of Dan Meredith. Yeah, Dan had came over. He had bought uh, David some uh, new uh, snowshoes because he was going to go to the mountains later with some neighbors. Yep. So that's why he he had come over there. And I think he was Uh, watching the kids while Evan was going to take a bath quick. Yeah, like I said, Dan was watching the kids. And he went into the front hallway when Chase entered the home. Yep. And was shot in the head point blank. Yeah, right off the bat. With his twenty two caliber handgun. So don't let anybody tell you that twenty two is not dangerous. So what it does, I mean, it won't it's not powerful enough, but when it enters the, the skull, it bounces around. Yep. 
so, Rick, ricochet effect. Yeah, and yeah. it will it will kill you instantly. Hmm. Yeah, so it's it's pretty powerful. It's powerful in its own way. Right. Again, this was the same gun used to kill uh, Ambrose Griffin and Teresa Wallen. Mm. So they've got a connection going on. And then Richard turned Dan's body over and stole his wallet and his car keys. And Jason ran into his mother's bedroom where Richard fatally shot him twice in the head at point-blank range. Yep. And on the way to killing Jason, uh, Richard also shot uh, David, which was a 22-month-old, in the head. Mm-hmm. Yep, he was in the in the playpen. Yep. Oh, and a while ago, I'm sorry, I said that David he brought David snowshoes. He had brought uh, actually Jason some snowshoes. Oh, so, okay. So sorry about that. That's all right. Now Just correct that. No problem. And then Chase went into the bathroom, and he fatally shot Evelyn once in the head. He dragged her body onto the bed, and where he sodomized her. Yes. And he drank her blood. And he, it seemed like he cut a series of slices out of the back of her neck Man. to be able to drink the blood out of her neck. Why he's doing what he's doing. Yep. And he, at this point, I guess his excitement, Dale, you know, from his erectile dysfunctions got solved. I guess so. Yeah, because uh, he was able to, you know, sodomize her body. And they found when they were, I guess, given the autopsy in her rectum, they found an unusual amount of... Uh, semen mm. so it, it seemed to be according to reports there was uh, more than one ejaculation so, and i and i guess in his mind drinking this blood and doing these acts was a cure for his i guess he had ED. enough blood yeah he had enough yeah. and this was a cure for it so because was, uh, schizophrenia i think he must have visited several times is that what we're saying yep mm. so this was a cure for his problem damn and when he was done, he stabbed her at least a, a half a dozen times in the rectum. And the knife penetrated her uterus, and he stabbed her in a series of vital points in the body, which caused blood from in her internal organs, I guess, to pull up in her abdomen. And then he sliced her open and drained it into a bucket. And then he consumed all the blood. My God. Yeah. This dude... And, what the hell? And like I said, it's, it continues to ramp up, and it gets worse. And Richard went into the bedroom and retrieved David's body. This is the 22-month-old. The baby. Yeah. And he took it to the bathroom and split his skull open in the bathtub and consumed some of the blood and brain matter. So he's eating his brains. Yeah. God almighty. Yeah. Yeah. This is definitely the worst dude we've done. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if there's many. How, how the hell can you get worse? I don't know. <laughs> now, just outside the house, there was a six-year-old girl who they were going to the mountains. She was coming to see if, if he was ready to go. Yeah, yeah. And she had knocked on the door, and it startled Chase, and he fled the residence, stealing Dan Meredith's car. Because remember, he he, he took, took his, his keys and his wallet. Yeah. yeah. And the girl alerted a neighbor, and the neighbor broke into the Miroff home, where she discovered the bodies and contacted the police. And when they got in the home... Can you imagine what she saw? I can't imagine a little girl seeing that stuff. How it affected her. Or, or their mom or whoever or anybody else went in. Yeah, I mean, you just walk into your neighbor's house and Well, see you know it. she had to win in. Yeah. You know, being right there. Because, you know, in her mind, they didn't have anything going on. She didn't think anything like, anything like that was happening. She was just going on a, the mountains. Yeah. Damn. Yep. And when they got in the home, police discovered that Chase had left handprints. And imprints of the soles of his shoes with Evelyn's blood on them. So this tells you right here he's not even he don't care. worried about getting caught. It's not he ain't even thinking that way. He's not killing for to be killing. He's doing this cause the for the blood aspect. His need. His to, need, yeah, cuz he's not even trying to hide evidence or anything. It's just I don't even know if he's even thinking about it. No, he's not. He just he cuz this is right there in the neighborhood, the yeah. right around where he lives, so yeah. He don't care. Mm. He just wanting that blood to cure his ED problem. Yeah, now, you know, when they went through the house and they seen all this stuff, you, you know, there was one thing missing. He took the baby with him. He took uh, the 22-month-old David with him. Ugh. Yep. And I guess in his mind, too, I've read and heard that this was young blood. Yeah. Untainted blood. Well, you know, when they ask him later, and I don't know if I'm spoiling anything there, but when they ask him later why he took the the baby said that he needed something to eat. Is was his answer. That's a sick man. That's sick. 
and he took David's body home with him, where Dale he he did the unspeakable. He did. He he chopped off his penis and he used it as a straw to be able to suck the blood out of little David's body. My God. And then he sliced his body open and consumed several internal organs. He made smoothies out of the others, and finally, he disposed of little David's body in a box behind a uh, nearby church. Now, Dale, it was just five days after the mass murder, and after hearing the FBI profile, remember the girl from the store, Nancy Holden, right? You know, that was able to get away. You know, the one that went to school with him. She contacted the police, saying that she believed that Richard could be the killer. Yeah, they said they determined that the killer was probably a tall, malnourished, you know, a loner, physically very unclean, and, you know, basically describing the dude who was stalking her butt in the store mm-hmm. the whole way. And they ran a background check on Richard, and they came across his registration of a twenty two caliber semi-automatic pistol. Yep. And the detectives and the police, they went to Chase's apartment to speak to him. Right. But I guess he didn't come to the door or something. Or Yeah, they went and knocked on the door and nobody came to the door. Yep. And detectives and police, they went next door because the apartment was empty. And they hid out in there and staked out his apartment for a little while. Right. I think one of the detectives actually went to the office of the, uh, the management office and, and called into the apartment. And he answered the phone. But then he realized he didn't know the voice, so he immediately hung up. Yeah. So then after that, I think that's when he got spooked and he took off. This was before caller ID. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, the police hid down the hallway and waited for Richard to leave and yeah. arrested him when he left the apartment, carrying a bloodstained box. And his orange parka and shoes were most likely bloodstained. Most likely, hell. Yeah. <laughs> and inside were pieces of shredded, blood-soaked wallpaper and bloodstained twenty two, which uh, he had committed to murders. Yeah. And Richard claimed... I think there was some brain matter in there, too. Yeah. And Richard claimed that the bloody wallpaper and bloody gun were a result of him killing several dogs. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just go with that. Yeah. Yeah. And when the police, you know, they searched... Can you imagine what this dude's apartment looks like? I can't imagine. But when the police searched, you know, his body, they found that he was carrying Dan Meredith's wallet. Yep. Yeah, they, they, they took him down, you know. He told you, he tried to run, and they jumped on him. I think there were two uh, detectives that were there, and besides the one who was at the office making the phone call. And when they took him down, he was fighting them and fighting them and trying to get reach for his pocket, and when they seen what he was reaching for, it was that wallet. Yeah. And then uh, so one of the detectives actually held him down and told him he needed to quit fighting and pulled his gun and stuck it in his ear and said, if you don't quit fighting, I'm going to blow your brains out. And said the guy never quit fighting, but he realized right then he just he wasn't like him. Mm-hmm. He couldn't shoot him. Now, they did find in Richard's apartment, uh, they found the walls, floor, ceiling, refrigerator, and all of uh, Richard's eating and drinking utensils soaked in blood Holy on shit. the counter and was the blender Chase used to make his smoothies. Yeah, I think there's a couple of them, actually. And it, uh, they said it was caked with coagulated blood and the rotting matter of internal organs. And inside the refrigerator, the police found animal body parts wrapped in aluminum foil, uh, David's brains in a Tupperware container, God and pieces of his body wrapped in saran wrap. And even several of Elvin Miroth and Teresa Wallen's internal organs. And on another counter were several pet collars. And then on the kitchen table, he had spread out numerous diagrams depicting various aspects of human biology and anatomy. Wow. So, yeah, he was wow. sick, no doubt. Now, I was just thinking, man, I'm assuming he, he wasn't eating anything except for this stuff. Yeah. All he was you know, because was- he was really skinny. He had lost a ton of weight, you know, but he was just drinking blood and eating body parts. And that's it. And I'm assuming he was just putting them in the blender and eating them. There wasn't no cooking or nothing going Smoothies, on. Smoothies, yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah. Now, now, in 1979, uh, Richard Chase stood trial on six counts of murder. But in order to avoid the death penalty, the defense tried to have Richard found guilty of second-degree murder, which would result in, to life in prison. But their case hinged on Richard's history of mental illness and the lack of planning in his crimes and evidence that they were not uh, premeditated. Right. But they even brought up the fact in court that, you know, sometimes when he killed, he wore 
latex gloves. So indicating that, you know, sometimes it, it was premeditated, that he was trying to, you know, stay clean. They thought about his murders. Yeah, but I don't, I don't buy that. Maybe he had some gloves. I don't know. But I don't think it was because he was trying to outfox anybody because, I mean, he left shoe prints and hand prints and yeah. blood everywhere and all over his clothes. And, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe he had some – maybe he had seen the doctors wearing gloves or something when they're doing <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he had that kind of aspect going, but yeah. I don't know about all that. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. Maybe they were premeditated, but it wasn't like it was – I don't know. It was just – I don't know. I don't even know. Yep. This is fucking weird. Yep. Now, on May the 8th, the jury found Richard Chase guilty on six counts of first-degree murder. And the defense asked for clemency during the hearing in which the judge determined that Chase was not legally insane. And Richard was sentenced to die in the gas chamber. Now, waiting to die, Richard, you know, the inmates, they tormented and on him oh yeah they found out what he did you know he's not going to be very popular in prison no you know especially him killing them kids yep and they even tried to get him to kill himself yeah that's what they kept telling him yep. better off he just done that yep and it was richard he was holding back on his antidepressant medication yeah he wasn't taking all of his pills he was i guess he was hoarding them up yeah i think you were they were giving them to him three times a day but uh, yeah it did i'm sure at this time it wasn't like they were Standing over and make sure he took them, you know, when they gave them to him. So it was a, and I forget the name of the mess, and I'd look mm-hmm. it up. Yep. And on uh, December the 26th of 1980, there was a guard doing cell checks and found Richard sort of lying kind of awkwardly on his bed and not breathing. Right. And an autopsy determined that Richard committed suicide with an overdose of, you know, the prison doctor prescribed antidepressants. Yep. That he'd been saving up for the few weeks. Yep. So he killed himself in the end. And there was a, a 1988 movie called Rampage that was kindly, loosely based on Richard Crimes. Hmm. Now we're getting back just to follow up on some stuff, Dale. The body of the little 22 month old David yeah. was found behind that church. Yeah, I think it was a custodian discovered the box and when he opened it. They found the decapitated body of yep. the little 22 month old boy. Yeah, so. Yeah, Richard never told him where he was or anything. And he, I don't know if he ever really said that he killed the people, did he? It was always he had killed uh, animals, but yeah. I don't know if he ever really admitted to it. No, but they had so much Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, you know, pretty damn obvious, but I don't know if he ever admitted to it. Did he? You know, he said basically he just had killed animals. But yeah. My God, dude. He went from rabbits to people and such rapid succession and just god he got so awful mm-hmm. i can't imagine and i mean look don't get me wrong i'm not saying they shouldn't have put him to death but them saying he was legally insane i mean what the hell he is yeah he was insane yeah no doubt about it but he did die on death row in san quentin yep by his own hand yep all right, that is the story of Richard Trenton Chase. And I hope the it vampire didn't, of Sacramento. I hope it didn't gross too many of you out, but that's we you know, we covered it pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. We give it to you whether you <laughs> whether you wanted it or not. Yep. It was, it was a it's a pretty pretty rough one there, Don. Yep. All right, Dale. We're going to get out of here. All righty, let's do it. We want everyone to be safe. Be careful and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is The The Crack Crack House House Chronicles. Chronicles.